yes? Do we have time for questions? We right? do. We okay. Have, uh, and unfortunately, the people in the video rooms don't have time for questions because we don't have a microphone there, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. So you're even in worse shape than you thought. But you can listen to the answers and then you can have, I should say, I make it a policy. We're not going to spend a long time with questions because it's damn hot and some people have to pee. But <laughs> I will answer some in, in here. But I will, I'll be, I'll be signing books. But more importantly, I'll be answering questions as long as you won't have questions. So people who are in the, in the, in the extra overflow rooms, if after the question period you want to come back here, I will be here uh, to answer your questions. Okay? So let's have a few. Do you, do you want to field your questions? I want to field my own questions, if that's all right. Of course. I think the dog has the first one. No. no. Okay. Any, any questions? Take one in the back. Yeah. Yes, you. You have to scream and laugh to repeat it for the people who are no longer in the oral forum. Yes, I think yeah. you made a great assumption mm -hmm. that the theory of uncertainty existed before our universe was emerged. You said that there. There's enough that there's just energy. There's no energy. energy. Or there's nothingness. That's yeah. I would say a term that there's nothingness on average. But uh, your further question saying that in a trillion years' time, the, there will be nothingness again, is not strictly speaking true. We will not see the things. We will see zero because it's so. There won't be even us. And the light uh, goes at the <coughs> There will be a universe with no matter, no radiation, and empty space. Which so is my question is, mm -hmm. uh, is the theory of uncertainty absolutely necessary for your operation? Okay, the question was, I'm assuming the uncertainty principle at some level of quantum mechanics when I talk about a creation of the universe or nothing. In a sense, that's right. So that was the question. And, and is that assumption necessary? The, the answer is no. But now I get an even stranger metaphysical ground that I don't feel comfortable on. Namely, it could be that quantum mechanics is a property of our universe alone. That even quantum mechanics arises when our universe arises. That other universes exist that don't have quantum mechanics, that are governed by other microscopic laws. But that's irrelevant. Because what I showed is we know quantum mechanics operates in our universe. And given that knowledge, and given what we know about gravity, quantum mechanics will allow the creation of space. There's nothing that's happening right now in our universe. And so, there, so, but when I say that, I have no, there's no theory, there's no, not even string theory that predicts quantum mechanics arises. A string theory assumes quantum mechanics is universal. And maybe it is, and maybe it isn't, I don't know. But it's possible that it could arise. But the important point is, it arose in our universe. It describes the properties of our universe, and very little extrapolation from what we know will allow the creation of spaces and times and matter and energy that look exactly like what we see. Once again, is that a proof? Absolutely not, since I don't even have a theory of quantum gravity. But, you know, Richard Dawkins was kind enough to write the afterword for, for this book, and he, he was, it was full of hyperbole. And he was kind enough to compare my book to the origin of the species, which I thought was a nice thing to do, especially for book sales. But, um, uh, but, and I, it's a little over the top because, of course, Origin of the Species is one of the greatest scientific books ever written, and mine's pretty good. But, <laughs> but there is some philosophical connection. Namely, when, when, Charles, when Darwin described natural selection and, and evolution, he didn't know about DNA. He, didn't, he, he described a plausible theory that explained the data. He didn't know about about the details of genetics. He looked at, he measured things and said, this is plausible, and with very few assumptions, I can arise at the diversity of life, and it agrees with the data. We now don't know what the origin of life is. We have, in spite of the fact that people think Darwin talked about origins of life, he didn't. But we're getting closer. And I think very few people today would argue that, well, I think it's highly unlikely that chemistry couldn't turn into biology by natural processes, but it's a postulate. And what is amazing, and what I want to celebrate in writing this book, is that cosmology is coming to this po similar point, where we don't have the fundamental theories. We just have amazing observations about the universe, and those observations are pointing in a direction which is interesting, and suggests that the universe can come from nothing by normal physical processes. There's no way that we can prove that. Um, but it's plausible, and that plausibility is what I think is worth celebrating, especially since I think the notion of God is absolutely so... Completely ridiculous.
I'll take um, one up here. Yeah. Uh, before I came here today, I had a question for you, but I think you destroyed it completely. Good. <laughs> My question was going to be, if the universe is exploding, where is the universe exploding into? It's a very good question. It's not a dumb question. People ask where. So the question is, if the universe is expanding or exploding, what's it expanding into? And the answer is, it doesn't have to expand into anything. You know, I, there are lots of examples of that. If I, the simple, old-fashioned examples, like if I take the surface of a balloon and blow it up, what's it expanding into? Nothing. Now you think it's expanding into the room, but that's because you embedded the two-dimensional surface of the balloon into a three-dimensional room. If the two-dimensional surface of the balloon was all there was, and I put dots on it, they'd all be moving apart when I blew it up, and, the, and nothing would be claimed closer to anything else, but it wouldn't be expanding into anything. That's, <laughs> If, if the two-dimensional surface is all there is, if our universe is a closed two-dimensional, three-dimensional universe, the same thing is true. Or it could be infinite. And similarly, if I have an infinite rubber bed sheet and I stretch it, it's okay. Good. <laughs> I'll start, I'll take someone from this side. Is there a connection between dark energy and dark matter? We love, is there a connection between dark energy and dark matter? And the answer is not that we can tell. Dark matter, we think we actually, they're relatively conservative and simple ideas about what the dark matter is. And every time we try and explain the standard model and the Higgs and the stuff we see in the Large Hadron Collider, it turns out that we, make, we predict other particles should be discovered there as well. And those other particles are very good candidates for dark matter. So we don't have to go into wild speculation. It, within the context of almost the standard model of particle physics, Dark matter comes out naturally. In fact, it's very difficult to have a theory that doesn't produce dark matter. There are lots of candidates. Dark energy is completely inexplicable. It just, it, it, it defies everything we understand about quantum field theory, that empty space should have this small energy. And so maybe there's a fundamental connection. And at some level, of course, if there is a theory that predicts it all, then there is a fundamental connection. But we can't see it. And that makes it exciting. Because, as I, as I often say to people, especially creationists, um, you know, we, not knowing is exciting. In fact, if you're a theoretical physicist, the two most exciting states to be in are confused and wrong. And I'm often in both. Because that means there's stuff to learn. That means there's something we learn. And that's another huge difference between science and religion. Science has made progress. Yeah? Oh, me? Yeah. Okay. Um, Lawrence, I hope this is a different question to the type of ones you're used to getting. But, um, me too. <laughs> but um, I was wondering, how do you find talking to philosophers, because there's a lot of people who like to talk philosophically when you want to talk scientifically. And I know one of your favorite characters, at least I hope he's your favorite character, Richard Feynman. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He exactly. always hated... He, he didn't like talking. He always wanted to talk scientifically. How do you find it? Well, look, I mean, the question is, how do I find talking to philosophers? And, and there are, you know, kids in the room, so I won't, I won't say explicitly. But, um, <laughs> uh, no, the answer is, look, uh, philosophical speculation is interesting. We all do it naturally. But, and, and I try to say this politely, but it doesn't come across that way. <laughs> that it has no impact on science. Philosophy has no impact on science. None. Zero. Physicists don't read, they don't know how to spell philosophy. They don't read philosophers. They don't read Popper. They don't read Kuhn. They, I, I mean, I did. But I learned by, if you wish, I learned the philosophy of physics from Feynman. I learned it by emulating physicists. And so these questions are quite interesting and reflection about the ideas I've given you is something you'll all do. Because you're all philosophers in a sense. And so, certainly what science does is give, is give the underlying understanding of nature that we can reflect about. But we don't learn about nature by thinking about it. We just don't. We learn about it by looking at it. And so, um, you know, one can talk about, and one can argue about whether the nothingness that I described is really non-existence. And you can have those arguments, but I don't give a damn about those arguments. I care about how the universe evolved. And if my nothingness isn't their nothingness, who the hell cares? I certainly don't. Um, I'll take what, two more questions. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, good. No, no. I have lots of my, I should say, there are lots of friends of mine 
poor philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here at the New College of Humanities, run by one of my great friends, Anthony Grayling, who's a philosopher. And so I have many friends who are philosophers, I just wouldn't want my daughter to marry one. No. <laughs> Uh, I should come back here. You look like you have a good question. Is it a good question? Yeah. Well, good. It's, it's a question. Oh. Um, how close are we to theory of everything? How close are we to theory of everything? Well, it's a, it's a question that I can't answer. And the answer is, I have no idea. Um, I have no idea if it's around the corner or not. Because the thing about ideas is you don't know when they're going to come out. With experiments, you can have an idea. We build a large hybrid collider. We knew there'd be something happening this year. But maybe the idea, maybe the key idea that's going to resolve these problems is something that she's got in her head right now and she has to go to the next grade like next year before she gets it. Okay? So I don't know. I am skeptical that we're anywhere near close. I'm not even sure there is a theory of everything. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Richard Feynman, who I wrote a book about, and, who said it doesn't matter. You know, I, I agree. I'm like Feynman. We just want to learn more about the universe. Maybe it's an infinite onion. Maybe every time you peel back a layer, there's another layer, and another layer. And you might say, what, why, what's the point? And the answer is because we want to learn more. And the point is it's enjoyable. And maybe I'll end with this, because one of my favorite myths is the myths of Sisyphus. And who, of course, as you know, is doomed for all eternity to roll a, a rock up a, up, up a mountain. And then just when he got to near the top, the rock would fall down. But just like Camus, I believe Sisyphus was smiling. Because the, it's the search that makes the whole thing worth it. It's the effort. It's the mystery. It's the adventure. And having the answer is not as exciting as searching for it. Thank you very much. No, no, I realize it's an insult to philosophers to lump them with theologians.